The elasticities we've studied so far are the own price elasticity, technically the own price elasticity of demand for X, which denoted E with a subscript X comma PX, and the income elasticity. or the income elasticity of demand for X. E with the subscript X comma I. Sometimes we leave out the words of demand for X, so I refer to the first one as just the own price elasticity, and the second one is the income elasticity. The last kind of elasticity we need to study is called the cross price elasticity. or a more formal phrase, the cross-price elasticity of demand for X with respect to the price of Y. It's denoted E with a subscript X comma P Y. And its definition is the percent change in the quantity demanded of X divided by the percent change in the price of Y. So you can see why it's called cross price because it's talking about how X changes when the price of some other good changes. So how does the quantity demanded for apples change when the price of ground beef changes? Or when the price of, yeah, when the price of ground beef changes. So that's in contrast to the own price elasticity, which is how the quantity demanded of apples changes when the price of apples changes. It's useful to connect the idea of cross price elasticity with complements and substitutes. So let's see how that works. Let's suppose that we have an increase in the price of Y. it follows that the quantity demanded of Y is going to decrease unless Y is a given good. And we know that given goods are really bizarre and might not exist in the real world or are highly unlikely, so let's ignore that. Let's ignore the given good possibility for now. So ignoring given goods, an increase in the price of Y leads to a decrease in the quantity demanded of Y. What happens next depends on whether X and Y are complements and substitu or substitutes. If X and Y are complements, then they move in the same direction. So if if uh, y decreases, then x decreases. If they're substitutes, then they move in opposite directions. So if y decreases, then x increases. So let's see what these two cases imply for the cross price elasticity, ex comma py which is percent change in quantity demanded of X divided by the percent change in the price of Y. In the first case, the percent change in quantity demanded of X is negative because X decreases. Percent change in the price of Y, well, we started out by saying that the price of Y increases. And therefore, this thing is negative. In the substitutes case, the percent change in the quantity demanded of X, well, X has gone up. The percent change in the price of Y, price of Y has gone up. So this thing is positive. So what we conclude is that complements 
have negative cross price elasticities and substitutes have positive cross price elasticities. Now that's true unless they're given goods. If they were if you were analyzing a given good, then these would switch. But we almost never analyze given goods. So for almost all practical purposes, you can forget that case. And therefore you can go with the with the typical case, which is, as I said before, complements have negative cross price elasticities and substitutes have positive cross price elasticities. One final somewhat miscellaneous point about demand. Demand curves are not empirically obvious. It is perfectly possible when you're studying, let's say, the market for apples to observe the following price-quantity combination in one year and this price-quantity combination in the next year. Now, of course, one way of interpreting that would be to say, oh, this is a demand curve and therefore apples are a given good, which is really weird. But an equally valid, in fact, a more valid way of interpreting exactly the same empirical observation is that these were two points in a supply curve. Now, I know we haven't studied supply curves, but you know what supply curves are from principles of economics, in that in the original year, the demand curve looked like this, and you had a shift in demand, so that in the next year, the demand curve looked like that. The point is that all you observe empirically are these two points. And what kind of story you tell depends on the th theoretical framework that you apply to the empirical observation. The data don't tell their own story. That's, I suppose, the fundamental reason why economics is, is very difficult, and therefore why economists, who, as I said in the introduction, have only been working at this for a couple of centuries, uh, don't know a lot about economics and often make mistakes because we have a lot of data, for instance, data like these two points, but the data don't tell their own story. Depending on what kind of theoretical perspective you bring to the data, you get different kind of conclusions. In the next lesson, I will work a fairly complicated example tying different elasticities together.